called Mean Order. Roll call. Mr. Bell. Here. Mr. Hua. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Dunn. Here. Mr. Bergstrom. Here. Mr. Gentile. Here. Ms. Goodman. Here. Uh, first item up is approval of the agenda. We know that we've got to make an adjustment to that. Um, to slip in the approval of the special meeting minutes. I make a motion to adjust or amend the agenda accordingly. I'll second that. All in favor? All right. All right. Public comment? None. Uh, approval of the regular meeting minutes from the 21st last month. Anybody see anything on those minutes that need to be corrected? Uh, my thing, except that the date for the, uh, what was it, the uh, strategic plan, it should be 2015 to 2020, uh, page 3 of 3. Okay. What, what is it again? 2015 to 2020. You have 2015 to 2010. Right. Oh. Otherwise, I'm okay with it. Motion to accept the minutes? I'll make a motion to accept the uh, corrected minutes. Corrected minutes for October 21st as presented. Give a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, now we'll move on to the Minutes of the special meeting held on November 13th. Do we want to make an adjustment saying it's Wednesday, or did we already talk about that? Wednesday, 13th. Wednesday, oh, that's right. So we've got to make a correction <coughs> so that any, make that any motion to approve. I'll approve on that, the exception of making the change to Wednesday, November 13th. Okay. Do a second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Treasurer's report. First item up would be accounts payable. Barry, is there anything on here that's unusual that you'd like to bring attention to? Mark, you Yeah, we've got. There's nothing unusual, but I will be Manistee Tire invoice $2,000 that is for um, tires for the snowplow truck. Okay. They're about a thousand dollars piece. Jumping dollars. Yep, and I saw it leave the tire tire shop there, so I know what happened. <laughs> and what I just out of curiosity, what is auto wares? You have repairs of main auto wares group. That's one of the auto parts. Yeah. Are there other? Yeah, it's advanced. the one. Is it advanced? No, it's not advanced. Oh, okay. But it's, I think it's the one on the one River, River Street. That's the That's Plus, one. I think. Okay. Or auto value. Auto value mm -hmm. is right there. Okay, so it's just the, it's one of those. One of those at any rate. It's a repair store. Okay. It's not parts, River parts. River. Airport license fee is only $100? <laughs> that, seems, that seems low. I'm sorry to make a joke out of that uh, compared to all the other bills we get. Do we have approval of the accounts payable or a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve the accounts payable for October 2019 as presented. So I have a question on that. Should we be increasing that? Or is that that's the state of the state sets that up? Yeah, that's just an invoice, so yeah. It yeah. just shocks me that they'd only charge us $100. Right. I'll support that motion. Okay. I'll, uh, roll call, please. Mm -hmm. table. Mr. Bergstrom. Yes. Mr. Haw. Yes. Mr. Dentz. Yes. Mr. Bell. Yes. Mr. Gentile. Yes. Ms. Goodman. Yes. Now we've got next up the financial statements, balance sheet, revenues, and expenses. <coughs> uh, 
just, just one thing out of curiosity. On the previous months, oh, was that a cleanup of last year's budget numbers that were included in there? The October receipts at the bottom, you mean? Uh, well, like the previous month for on the reach revenue and expenses, October 2000, I'm reading from that, it says the previous month. So far, that's just what, what was paid. Okay, is that kind of cleaning up for the end of the budget? Not yet, no. no. So those are just actual expenses. Okay, I mean, it's just look how high it is compared mm -hmm. to the current month. Well, so it's the, the biggest issue there mm -hmm. is with mm -hmm. the airline. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to everything else that's going on with our air service, DOT had an invoicing problem where I couldn't submit invoices to them because as of September 1st, they switched their system around assuming we were going to have 19 seat service, but we ended up continuing to have 30 seat service, so I couldn't actually invoice for 30 seat, and it took until last Friday to get that resolved. So that's an in and out. So if you look oh, at okay. that first line, oh, that okay. federal grant, you see there's nothing there. And then down below, that's correspondence with that AEAS contract. Okay. It's pretty much an in and out, so that's what that huge difference is, because we didn't get that in October. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so we're two months behind on the billings for um, the airline. And that's good squared out now. They got submitted on Friday. What is uh, page two, the assets, the Orchard Beach Aviation? Why is that highlighted 930? 236763. Over here. Oh, yours isn't highlighted. It shouldn't be highlighted. Okay. Just to add color. <laughs> Anything, Barry, on this that you want to bring to our attention? Um, the grant payments under the essential air service was the only comment that I had. Do we have a uh, motion to approve the financial statements for October? So moved. Second? I'll second it. Roll call or we're all in favor on that one. You don't need to roll call for that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, moving on to committee reports. So the executive committee did not meet, although just an update, Barry and I met after the last meeting and did sign. The, his extension contracts. Uh, you were comfortable. You reread those afterwards, and so we're all good there. Okay. Um, the budget committee did not meet, and the capital projects committee met um, following the special meeting for about 15 minutes uh, to bring everybody up to speed on that. The when we at the last board meeting. We discussed or gave you a report on the Ryan Shively hangar acquisition process. <clears throat> following that meeting, I mean immediately following that meeting, Barry and I got on the phone with George Saylor, reviewed all the details again. He he uh, he totally understood it after that phone call. I, and I don't know where the miss. I don't know that it was a misunderstanding. It was just it became clear. So. The process is such that uh, he agrees that we can sign a lease with Ryan and we can also sell Ryan that building. So we can sell it to him in lieu of a dollar or whatever low fee we determine and build the cost that we want to see him invest into the land lease. So he, George prepared new documents for us that uh, we reviewed. That's what I brought to the committee after the special meeting last week and just gave them an update. Leaving that meeting, the ball's in my court to go back to Ryan and get some hard dollars and cents timelined out. Uh, he has already met with uh, electricians to change the service over. 
He's finalizing the pricing on that. He's got a door in process. His, his intention that he gave to us was that the first five years he was going to do it. The electric, the door, convert the, uh, fix the foundation, paint the exterior. So he had quite a bit lined up for five years. He just didn't have dollars and cents on that yet. So I'll meet with him, get the dollars and cents pinned down, go back to the committee, and hopefully by the meeting in December, this is a done deal and we can sign off and he's happy and we're all happy. Uh, besides that item with the capital projects, we had uh, the T hanger. I've, I've, we received some estimated pricing in for the painting. So we now have, without going to bid, which will be a different project, we have an estimate on doors to finish the building, painting to finish the building, and hanging of those doors. So that can go to the, the authority now as to the direction they want to go next year or the next few months if we want to go to the county as we've discussed many times at this table and get a loan from the county to do that project all at one time with a payback schedule that is equitable and workable for the authority's budget and acceptable to the county. That led us to the special meeting that we've got and do you want to speak to where, where should we speak to that meeting? It's on here and uh, get further later. down. Okay. okay so so that's an update on the two capital projects that have been kind of ongoing for a little bit and so the, the next move is for me to go to uh, to summarize everything to do with the T-hanger and to meet with Ryan and go back to the committee with uh, dollars and cents. Can I ask questions? Um, yes. Because I, I know nothing about this but the hangers are sitting on airport property, correct? The tea hangers? I don't like the one that you said that was Shively's the buy or purchase? Yes. So he purchases the hanger at the property, correct? Correct. I, I, it's our property. I, I mean, I don't know why you have private so, sales and that leases. So if you go back to, we'll go back and just as an example, Ted Aaron's right. back in the 98, 798, right finalized in 99, approached the airport, wanted to build a, his own private hangar on airport land, mm -hmm. which is allowable. So the airport, the authority signed a land lease with him. He could build whatever he wanted. At the end of the term of that lease, that building becomes the possession of the airports. Barry owns a hangar. Orchard Beach owns a hangar in the same situation. He, he purchased it from Bill, uh, Bill House. House who did the same thing, signed a long-term lease, 30 years, okay. I believe, uh, built whatever building you wanted, and then at the end of that 30 years, it, it reverts back to the airport. So this is kind of coming at it backwards. We have a dilapidated building that's going to cost this authority money because you can't rent it in the condition it's in. <clears throat> we looked at investing $100,000 in it two years ago for the airline and had talked to the county about a loan for that dollar amount to fix the building to make it rentable to where we could receive income and pay, pay back the county. So now Ryan Kemp comes to us and says, hey, I've got this World War II plane. Won't fit in any building here except that one. Mm -hmm. Would you sell, us, sell me that building is what it's come down to, and then I'll sign a land lease. So when checking with George, he said we can do that. So we sell him the building for a dollar. Mm -hmm. He takes possession in as his condition. It comes off our responsibility, our liability and taxes or uh, insurance. And then the parameters we put on his lease, he's going to invest fifty, forty, fifty thousand dollars to fix it up. And at the end of that term, it comes back to the airport. Do we have a standard? You know, it's like. Um, do we have a standard lease, like anybody that wants to come, it, it may be 30 years and you can't build a two-story, I mean, do we have any parameters, or if I want to come and do a pink polka dot, you know, hanger, can I do that? We do. We okay. have. All right. Good. You want, you want to speak to that? <laughs> um, I didn't realize that we had that, but uh -huh. we do. Okay. Um, in reviewing Ted Aaron's lease, it refers to a document called our land lease policy, um, which I had never seen. Um, Julie was able to dig up 
through the board minutes from 1999, um, a draft of that policy, and then the board actions in a series of two meetings of the changes they wanted. So I've actually recreated that policy. That policy does need to be updated mm -hmm. um, because there are some things in it that are not appropriate any longer. Mm -hmm. um, but you know that is we do have a policy that is the document that those types of things are maintained in. Right. I guess I would look at it as you're, you're condominiumizing for a time frame, and there are restrictions on what can and cannot be done in those buildings. Right. It yeah. has to be airport related. Yeah. Well, well, like it's, a key yeah. Instrument, I believe, right. Right. it's pretty common. I mean, if you were to look at the Cadillac Airport, I bet they've got which I did eight or nine mm -hmm. different buildings yeah. over the years that have been. Um, built under the same scenario, some of which are back in the possession of the airport now. <coughs> it's, it's a common practice, we just haven't seen a lot of it here. Mm -hmm. uh, this situation with Ryan is, I don't think anybody in here would disagree, it's going to help us mm -hmm. tremendously. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to know the, how that happens. Yeah. Yep. So, thank you. In fact, our, you know, reading through this lease, there's a lot of stuff in this lease right here. In fact, what you're asking about is spelled out in here that the airport authority has the final say-so as to what is constructed on that property. Mm -hmm. But we have to have an, we have to have an understanding. I mean, I might say, sure, go right, ahead. Right, right, right. I mean, so yeah. as an authority, right, I want right. to know that we have some parameters mm -hmm. right. that we follow. An example to our control, Ted, was it a year ago he tried to sell the hangar? A couple, two, probably two years two ago. Two years ago, and he hung a big for sale sign on the side of it. You may have seen it, mm -hmm. and so we had to let remind him that he can't have that on there. It doesn't yeah. look good for us. Okay, so. Maybe look twice like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I had more than one person asking, the airport's for sale? <laughs> <laughs> what, joke in my head? Um, so that is the uh, committee reports. Any, any committee members have any comments? Other than what I've said, we'll hear. No, I think well. you were right. Okay. Um, so that moves us right into airport director's report. No incidents or accidents for the month to report. Um, we were scheduled to have our annual ins airport inspection last week, but the Friday before I got a call, our inspector had been called off to do an investigation, whatever that means. Um, and I'm now rescheduled with a different inspector for um, the early mid part of December. So I don't have anything to report to that other than rushed around to get ready for the inspection and then got uh, a reprieve. Um, two, uh, one thing, two things, if I can think of the second one that I forgot to put on here, um, is in the last month I've had a, a really good conversation with um, Rob Carson and one of his staff people as it relates to our zoning issues with the township they're going through their master plan right now and just really made sure that Rob and the planning department who's doing the master plan for the township understands the airport's needs, what the rules are around it, um, etc. And it, it was a good meeting. Um, and a little bit in that meeting this came up, but also a couple things since that meeting have um, raised this question and so the, the question specifically, or in a roundabout way, is I got a call two, probably two weeks ago from um, someone in economic development up at Sault Ste. Marie. And they are doing zoning around their airport. 
and they asked me if we had in our zoning around the airport any special zoning district specifically tied to airport related services. And I said, no, right now we don't have anything um, special around the airport. Although that was part of the conversation with um, Rob about should the area around the airport be zoned industrial to encourage um, potential businesses related to that. The Sault Ste. Marie case was even more specific. Instead of using an existing zoning definition, they um, are looking at creating something special that really specifies airport-related or aeronautical-related activities. Um, I'm mentioning that because I'm quite sure if the township um, is left to their process, nothing like this will ever come through. Um, if this is something that we think is important, you know, I guess I'm looking for direction. Is this something I should follow up on, or is you know just you know generic thinking about um, business and economic activity in the vicinity of the airport is sufficient? Are the feds going to require anything? Um, the feds have certain requirements, but that's not around the economic development side of things. It's more about heights of buildings and objects in the vicinity of the airport. Yeah, yeah. And a little bit on density of residential areas. Um, there, there's one area kind of across from the hospital that kind of falls in that um, the planning department's going to look at a little bit better just to make sure that it's not, um, that it's in compliance with um, the requirements. So you don't see any problems? I don't, I don't see any problems, but it is interesting that the the way the airport is oriented um, you know we kind of our approach area for runway 9 which is our east west runway is pretty much along 31 um, and particularly on the west side of 31 kind of some of you know that large, you know, 20 area vacant um, development site there kind of is right smack dab in the middle of that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, while development isn't yet happening there, it's just something, the timing is good for us to be having these conversations. Another thing in along these same lines that's come to my attention, this was a couple months ago, is that Traverse City, in their zoning, actually has aesthetic requirements around the airport that buildings must meet certain aesthetic requirements to make sure they tie into the aesthetic of the airport, which really seems strange. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, again, that's just a trigger of, is there anything through the master planning process with the township that we would feel would be important now would be the time to, to think about that. So I don't expect you all to have these thoughts, but if you do have anything, you know, maybe we can bring it up at the next meeting if you have thoughts. And you were working with Rob. Rob is. Yes. Yeah, so yep. you know, he's going to probably be on top of I, any restrictions. Rob is with the county? Yes. yes. And he's Come working with the township. The township is contracting our master plan review in Madison Township okay. right now, and they're contracted to the County for that review, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it's basically nothing more than trying to make sure we're in compliance. Yep. So we, if we get chase whatever FAA money, we don't want to give anybody a reason to say, uh uh. Okay. Well, but, it would also make sense to look at the bigger picture. You know, it's like, I, until you said that, it's like, yeah, that, that residential, because I, I know when the <coughs> flights change, because they come up the lake and I can mm -hmm. come over our. And then they circle down into that that subdivision, and it's like, yeah, you know, that is something I never thought about. But it would be great to plan appropriately, also too. And again, I don't, you know, I don't have much influence in Nancy Township, but you know, it is changing. It is becoming more commercialized, and you see more and more residential kind of being moved out. You know, so <coughs> making a good plan will be important. 
and having the airport in that plan is mm -hmm. good. Wasn't that part of the reason to cut those trees for all those trees? I mean, those are, yes, requirements that we have. Um, those are generally even nearer in than some of these other approach areas that extend out. I mean, in general, there are two things that are, from an airspace standpoint, one is just safety, so, you know, object heights. But the other is um, trying to deal with the issue of noise mm -hmm. and people. Um, and, you know, a lot of airports get in trouble where the airport's been there forever, but new people move in right. next door and now complaints start happening. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, so generally you're d discouraged from having residential too near certain aspects of the airport. So knowing that the plane, uh, one of the routes goes over um, and across 31 from that residential area, across 31 to here, would you really want to build another residential and all those lots that are open next to it? Yeah. So that's kind of the important thing right. to think about. Mm -hmm. Especially if we anticipate growing with more jet traffic, right. et cetera, things that are going to be louder, noisier, mm -hmm. bigger. Um, you know, those are, again, thinking ahead to make other sure that Other than the know. one incident down the taxiway, have you had any comments? Over the years, with the increased jet traffic, I, you know, I think of Arcadia, all the jets that are coming in. No, nothing local. I mean, we have had, we do, I'll say on average once a year, get calls from the general public complaining about the sightseeing flights. Um, <laughs> and they can, you know, be anywhere in the area. Mm -hmm. um, just because it's repeated yeah. and, you know, periodic. Um, so that has been... Um, an area of complaints in the past. I didn't know I could complain. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and you know what the solution is? I'll figure it to you. <laughs> Bigger mufflers on the plane. Barry, what about the, the development that's allegedly going in the corner of 31 and 22? Because some of that allegedly is going to have residential. Right. Um, the approach actually is on the other side of your development, it's really kind of over the campground. It's not mine. Well, <laughs> <laughs> broadly speaking. Um, so it's actually a little bit of ways from that, so I don't see that as an issue. It's just I've seen some drawings and it looks a lot taller than what the resort is. That, I have not seen anything, and oh. that actually does, and I, I've mentioned this to Rob, and we're not necessarily trying to handle this right now, but it gets into the question of sovereignty and well, that's rules. not that's, that's not, not federal land trust. trust. Yeah, oh, so that land. piece is not no. okay. That's okay. Um, but we've had this issue around the casino proper and, and some of the things. It's just you know, for the land that is in what's the term in trust. Um, you know what you know issues because you know again going north that does kind of cut across a good swath of that land that's mm -hmm. in trust. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a topic that needs to be addressed at some point, or at least broached. Um, um, but we're not well, focusing on that right now, it's just the township. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important that people can we'll have more discussions. Yeah. 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 I just read recently that it's how for zoning casino was. That would be a downwind leg for for <laughs> I would say probably nine, one zero. It could be, depending on its mm -hmm. location right. and height. Okay, um, so I'm actually going to kind of quickly gloss over airfares. They really look bad this month. But I don't really have good confidence that these numbers are an apples to apples comparison because Gail, who works for me, started this and then she left for vacation on Thursday and then I finished it on Sunday. And it's entirely possible that airfares change between those days. So the Manistee numbers are from Sunday, the other airports numbers are from earlier in the week. So I. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. How many seats are we filling right now, anyway? Especially at 418 bucks. Uh, I'll 
I'll talk about that in a, in a second because there there is more information on that. Okay. So. so then, moving on to our um, passenger numbers for October, um, we recovered well for October. We were up 17% versus a year ago. I will say that the numbers are slightly inflated because the operator that we had for most of the month, Silver, they required that one of their mechanics ride every flight. So we had one extra passenger every flight for the month, non-paying. <laughs> non-paying, so they it's have not... another three. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not generating any revenue, so it's... And at, at, at the end of the year, we do reporting that basically kind of pulls out those non-revenue passengers. So the numbers will ultimately report to the state, won't have them. But we don't do that at this stage because I don't have that level of detail for this. So you know, it's probably a little bit inflated, but um, it, it is you know, still a good recovery. Um, however, um, our performance in October, um, there was one canceled flight, which that's you know not a huge deal, um, but 34% of flights were delayed, which puts our on-time percentage at 64%, which was the worst for October since 2008. So about 12 years, you have to go back to the good old Great Lakes days um, when we had a worst. Any explanation? Was that the snow in Chicago here? No, it's just Silver's operations. They were not concerned with necessarily being prompt. Um, so they would show up and then, you know, unknown reasons, they wouldn't, you know, move the airplane for an hour after, you know, they were, we would have thought they would have been ready to go. So. So that is what it is. So, yeah. fuel system monitor. I'm currently in the process of getting quotes from both Northern Pump and Sparling Corp for um, that um, module replacement. The Jet A meter that had gone out a couple months ago and Northern Pump came in and basically installed a loaner meter until that came in, has come in, has been installed, and the loaner has been returned to Northern Pump. We haven't yet received that invoice. Capital projects, I don't have anything new here to report. Um, still waiting for the consultant to pull together the submittal package for the relocation costs. The um, nothing really new to here to report on the runway, still tentatively scheduled for the week after Memorial Day next year, or week and a half. Um, the change order, still awaiting George's conversation with Reith Riley on that. I haven't pushed him because he's been working on other things that are more important, um, but that is still outstanding. Question. Yes. Has Reith Riley settled their strike? I haven't heard of what? I don't think they have. So we could still be on strike next May? Uh, Hopefully not, but <laughs> who knows? I suspect they will have alternate workers by that time frame, given what I've heard them discuss. Is that they're planning backfilling with other, other staff to get previously committed projects completed. Office staff. Because the the work group that is on strike is just their equipment operators, so oh, it's okay. actually not a large number of individuals. So they got several different groups so, or unions in there. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, air service update. So Getting a little bit more yeah, into some of those to, details. Uh, on the wildlife survey, anything yep. unique that, that popped up from that survey or anything? Um, there are two things, two recommendations. One being that we look at how our fence is maintained. Um, 
we have an area of fence, and I'm just trying to think if anyone's on board long enough. I don't think so. Uh, it's probably close to nine, eight, nine years ago now. Um, we have an area of fence kind of off into the marsh uh, along basically on the other side of the bluff as it kind of wiggles around the runway on that on the south side of the airport. And it's kind of at the base of this bluff. And what happens is, is in the winter the winds predominantly out of the west or northwest, the snow blows, and then basically <coughs> once the bluff drops off, that snow just dumps, and basically you can get 10 feet of snow piled up against that fence, which has caused it once to be completely torn down. Um, it was, so we filed an insurance claim, which basically paid for strengthening it a little bit, heavier duty clips to attach the fence to the poles, but when the poles bend, there's only so much you can do. Um, so a couple of winters after that, we've tried snow fencing and other things to try to minimize that snow load. So that fence isn't in the best shape um, because of multiple years now of, of snow load. So that is a concern that's coming out of the wildlife report. But given its location, there's not much we can do um, to prevent this from happening. Do we have any deer coming up through on the um, fence? Theoretically, we could. But we um, we've had, in the years since that fence has been in place, we've had one deer inside the fence, and it was basically a fawn, um, and it would run along the fence with its mother outside. Hmm. How that fawn got in, you know, they're, they're small. It, it could have been any could area. It could have been in that area or it could have been some other place. So eventually we were able to you know, get everybody to run out the gate when it was open. To, to so do we have a liability if, if a, there is an accident with a deer or something? Uh, I mean, we have a potential, yes, which is why, we, why we have the fence and, yes, why we carry insurance okay. and all of those things. Um, but, I mean, the reason we have a fence is to prevent these issues. Yeah. So we can't let it deteriorate too far. Mm -hmm. It's being raised as an issue. The second issue kind of goes along with that is most airports have what they call a perimeter road, which is basically a road, not necessarily gravel or even paved, it could be just a two-track, that basically goes around the perimeter so that you can regularly inspect the fence and, and do those types of things. Given where that fence is going, there is no ability to have a perimeter road there because you're either up on the bluff 20 feet above it and it's just brush and other things, you know, kind of covering up the fence, or you're down in marshland and so the recommendation is that we get a perimeter road. How we accomplish that, unknown. Um, and that's why I've got Priya Newhoff listed here is ultimately a fix for this is well outside of our budgets and is going to need um, grant funding to accomplish. I want to make sure that the wording in the wildlife hazard assessment checks off all the boxes that we would ultimately need to apply for um, a grant for it. So I'm waiting on Priya Newhoff suggested wording changes just to make sure that we word every, or it is worded correctly so that we're not missing an opportunity. Can we change the location of the part of the fence that uh, is a concern? Like, can we move it closer to the airport rather than that drop off? Um, it can't be on top of the bluff because then it's too close to the runway. Oh, okay. So okay. it needs to be off the side. Um, and the farther away you get, you know, now you're in real wetlands, and you know, okay. so it, it it's a it's a wetland. I mean, it's just all of the hot buttons. It's a wetlands issue. It's you know, so thank you. So that's the long story of what that's going on there. Okay. Um, air service update. So. 
this fills in a little bit more details from the, the high-level numbers that I presented earlier. So the numbers for October were good, um, except for the fill the A's. Um, we are continuing to see um, delays in getting uh, the H-1900, which is the intended aircraft to be operating post Labor Day. We're now two and a half months after that time frame and we're still waiting. And this is causing problems. I'm going to go into more of that. Um, the flight data recorder, which was the original issue that was discovered that prevented the certification of the airplane, should be completed in its installation today, um, was the update I got on Friday. Um, but in addition to that, there was I'll say a, a hiccup in the crew training for the new aircraft. Um, there are two ratings that a pilot to fly that type of aircraft in the scenario that um, we're needing, they need. One is an AT, well, and to be captain specifically. One is an ATP rating, and the other is a type rating for the specific type of aircraft. Um, when the crew members were hired, they had the requisite number of hours, but they hadn't actually um, acquired their ATP rating. They started the type rating process, were halfway through that, when it was discovered that they needed the type rate or the ATP rating, and ATP stands for Airline <coughs> Transport Pilot. Um, so they stopped their type training, went back and got their ATP type, then they are now this week finishing up their type rating on the beach aircraft. So even if everything checks out as it should in the next day or two for the flight data quarter, we don't have crew until the end of the week to actually operate the plane. Gives you a warm fuzzy too to know they're freshly trained. <laughs> yeah. So that's where things stand. Um, so maybe this is uh, Jim Gallagher that's uh, orchestrating all this? Um, multiple people involved, but ultimately Jim is paying for everything. Um, Ultimate Jet is the one that's oh, okay. technically okay. hiring the crews and um, operating the aircraft. Um, so, and there was a little bit of finger pointing between both of those as to who missed the um, crew mm -hmm. training issue. I can imagine. Um, so how does that translate into November? So October was good. Um, we had basically silver for the entire month of October except the last two days. Um, November has been not so good. So I think maybe I mentioned this last month, um, silver, who's based in Florida, does mostly Caribbean um, flying, didn't have a snow and ice control plan um, approved by the FAA, so they couldn't really continue on after the end of October. So Jim Gallagher, Public Charters, has pieced together service this month. Um, what we've been seeing is Monday through Friday, Ultimate Jet has been operating, <coughs> but with the same schedule we had a year ago. So basically, anyone flying Monday through Friday this month got a call that said either their flight was now six hours later or six hours earlier, depending on which flight they were booked on, which created a whole whole set of public relations uh. issues and um, nightmares. Um, on weekends, we've generally been operating with uh, a King Air out of either Gaylord or Traverse City, but those cannot go into the terminal. They cannot go through TSA because they're not certified for that. So they've been going into the General Aviation Facility down at Midway and then being shuttled back and forth to the terminal, and also being limited to nine passengers on those, those planes. This past Saturday, there was no aircraft available, so public charters actually purchased tickets out of Traverse City for people, 
and had them fly out of Traverse City as how to cover um, for our service. If the training doesn't wrap up by Friday for the 1900 to start operating Saturday, we currently have nothing scheduled for handling our passengers this weekend. So, and the assumption is, is that next week, which is also a holiday week, with full flights, that everything will be, you know, running as it was supposed to be two and a half months ago. We will see. Um, this is impacting November significantly. We're current, I'm projecting we'll be down 30% versus a year ago, which is, and last year was down versus the previous year because we weren't operating Saturdays and we had the less desirable schedule. So we'll be down about 36% from two years ago. Part of this is Thanksgiving. Normally on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving and the Sunday after, we operate three flights. But because of all the uncertainty, I'm not having them. We did not add those flights this year because, you know, completely ruining 60 people's Thanksgiving right. would just be terrible. So we're, our exposure there is limiting to ruining 19 people's Thanksgiving. Um, and because of the timing of Thanksgiving, that Sunday after Thanksgiving actually is December 1st. So that kind of pushes some of those loads that previous years were in November into December. So all of those factors um, put us together for a November that we won't we really would be wanting to look back at for a number of years. Um, any questions on air service related things for where things currently stand? Kind of a late picture today, Harry. It's, uh, it's been a lot of, yes. Oh, no. Nothing other than a comment uh, would make it, because obviously it won't be too awful long, we'll be looking at a new essential air service contract. And contrary to what many of us thought, and I still think a jet is important, but schedule definitely trumps the plane. You know, no question about it. Now we know. We've got real-time data that prove that. So. And I'll, I'll also add to that is reliability. Oh, no question. If, if people can't trust that it's going to go mm -hmm. the way it's going to go, yeah, it's, it doesn't matter what the If we can't be reliable, we might as well not be in the business. Right. Period. Okay, I've gotten lots of complaints in the last month. Letters, emails, phone, Facebook, word of mouth. It's, it's not been a pretty, pretty last four weeks. Um, I already mentioned when we were doing the financial report that the DOT billing's behind, um, you know, because public charters has, as they've been piecing together all of the subservice, it's costing them significantly more than them operating themselves, and the fact that they haven't been paid now for, you know, a significant amount of time, they are hurting financially been hearing that so everything got submitted on Friday I don't know how long it typically typically takes for DOT to approve those invoices and transfer the funds but as, as soon as those funds are available um, we need to get those transferred over to avoid potentially an even worse situation um, Jeff just kind of segued me into this next topic, so the, the new EAS selection process for our next contract, our current contract ends the end of the fiscal year, so the end of September. I am anticipating that DOT will release the RFP for service in January. Um, I started working with DOT late last week because I've been trying to get them to solve their billing issues first. Um, but I've been you know, researching about kind of what's currently in the region, who's bidding, what's kind of the feedback on certain things. I've talked a little bit about that in the past. I did get a call this past week from SkyWest Airlines looking for information. Um, basically, they were requesting an update on the information I gave them two years ago. So I know they are looking at us. Um, I also have now requested from DOT 
guidance as to how to potentially divide up our contract in a seasonal nature. There is one airport, Bar Harbor, Maine, that has two different EAS contracts. They have a summer contract where they basically <coughs> contract with 30 seats or in the past 50 seat service and then a winter contract where it's less frequency and um, smaller aircraft. Very similar to our needs. Um, I was hoping two years ago to maybe facilitate something along those lines, but the wording that DOT put in the RFP didn't really, it just said the bidder should consider our seasonal meet demands. It didn't really talk about the possibility of multiple seasonal bids. So I've explicitly put to DOT the question, if that were a desired outcome, how could we facilitate that, and then how could we then request for bids for that? One of the reasons I'm thinking of this is, as it relates to SkyWest, SkyWest would be a perfect carrier in the summer with 50-seat regional jets. Um, and you know, we would have the demand to actually make that make sense. SkyWest in the winter, two issues. One <coughs> is we don't need two flights a day at 50 seats each when we're typically you know, 20 passengers or less. And two, and this is something that's coming in from the other um, markets that are kind of going through bidding right now, is there's at least two markets that I'm aware of that either currently are, or I guess actually in both cases, they currently are served by SkyWest, where there's significant complaints about their performance in winter. And this really just boils down to Chicago O'Hare and a United Regional Airline serving marginal routes. If there's bottlenecks, the first flights that get delayed or canceled are those that generate the least revenue. And that's ultimately what United is going to make the call on. They're going to say, we've got so many planes that can you know, take off an hour because of snow and conditions. We're going to have to cut back some. We're going to cut back the ones that generate the least revenue. So I'm, you know, concerned for a couple of those reasons with a SkyWest being uh, a year-round bidder. But I don't want to discourage them if they want to bid that. That's fine because um, that may still be better than what we have. But in kind of looking at an ideal scenario, maybe that wouldn't be the ideal scenario. So there's multiple contracts. So that sounds like it has potential. So, I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I've requested from DOT, and they were going to converse amongst themselves just to see how and if that might be possible. And I don't know how Bar Harbor got into that situation, whether it you know, stems all the way back to you know, the beginning of EAS or if it's something that's transpired more recently. So with that, here are the list of air carriers that have recently bid in this region. So, SkyWest, 50 seat, branded as United Express. Cape Air, nine seat, recently introduced a new aircraft that's nine seat, that had, and Cape Air generally does a, I um, uh, can't think of the word right now, um, it's not code share, but it's the one step below that with American at their sites. Interline. It's, it's more than interline, but it's less than a code share because they also do have interline agreements with all the majors, Delta, United, American. So you can buy an itinerary that has tickets for both on it and it kind of seamlessly works through, through those interlines baggage works through, etc. So they are in some ways, other than the size of the aircraft, um, you know, well suited potentially for us. Air Choice One, who's bid on us at pretty much every bidding cycle, also nine seat service. They currently serve Ironwood um, in the UP 
and Ironwood is actually in the middle of their, or just started their selection cycle now. Did you say that's nine seats too? Nine seats, yep. Um, Boutique, who bid on us last time, um, also with nine seat aircraft. Silver, who was doing the subservice here in October. What I'm hearing through the grapevine is they like the area enough that they may want to come in and put a bid. Um, Southern. They're 19. They're 30. Yep. 36? Yep. Um, Southern operates nine seat aircraft and um, has bid in this region, doesn't actually serve anyone in the Midwest right now. Elite, I'm putting up here, this is, Elite's more speculation than anything else, but I just read yesterday that Milwaukee has contracted with Elite to re-in, re reintroduce Midwest Airlines. Um, Elite last winter offered service from Traverse City to Florida. Um, there have been conversations that I've heard about um, between Elite and Traverse City where Traverse City is looking at competing directly with us head on and creating a route to Midway with Elite offering that service. Um, so Elite's in the area looking for business. I don't know if they would contemplate doing getting in the ES market or not, but they're looking for business in the area. How many seats are? 50. 50. Yep. Uh, Denver Air Connection just put in a bid for a, um, an airport in Minnesota. They're obviously from their name generally based in Denver, but their bid for the Minnesota airport was to Minneapolis, so they're certainly looking outside of their typical, and they operate either 30 or 50 seat jets. And then obviously North Country Sky, our current um, situation, I certainly anticipate them um, working with us on a bid um, if we get that far. Elite is jet service? Yes. Next. So the, the nine seat carriers are Cape Air, Air Choice One, Boutique, and Southern, and everything else is generally 30 or 50 seats. When Boutique was here last, uh, they were trying to they were trying to convince us that they were looking at some sizable increase in their planes, seating capacity. Nothing has happened in the you know, last two years to accommodate that, but... So, you know... There's not much in between, is it? There's there, a lot of seats or just a few? Because there's really no aircraft. Um, the all the 19-seat aircraft really have aged out of the system. Um, and, you know, that's true you know, for the 30 seat aircraft as well. So you have this you know, big gap, which again, with our seasonal seasonality, makes it hard either way for a, you know, a nine seat aircraft, we easily, especially if we had actually, you know, connections that were reasonable. Um, right now we easily do, you know, 60 people a day and, you know, weekends in the summer. That's, you know, 10, or not, that's seven um, flights with a 9 seat aircraft. Um, and if, you know, we do that today, I could easily see, you know, 80, 90, 100. You know, that's, you know, 11, 12 flights a day with a 9 seat aircraft. That's just, the crew issues to do that is just not reasonable. But that's just two flights a day with a 50 seat jet. So, that makes sense. In the winter, on a Wednesday, where we do less than 10 people, you know, having two 50 c jets fly doesn't make sense either. So, you know, the aircraft are kind of bifurcated in size, but our needs also are seasonally. So, which is why some of the things I'm trying to accomplish with DOT. Uh, last slide here, marketing update. Um, we basically turned down our marketing spend. We started this basically in September, initially anticipating the airport closure for the runway work, but then that just kind of spilled into the service issues and the not knowing who was going to be flying and when they were going to be flying. 
you know, a week in the future. So we kind of turned that down. Um, but after two and a half months, we can't just <coughs> be quiet. So we did last week um, send out a, kind of our typical, you know, mid-month email blast to our um, mailing list. Um, we are currently planning to have our typical Cyber Monday fair sale. Um, but, you know, if we, if we have a meltdown over Thanksgiving, we will not be doing that fair sale. So. Gary, what is the Cyber Monday fair sale again? Um, it, it's basically 10 to 25% off, um, basically, per ticket, per tickets purchased on that day. The Monday after Thanksgiving. Any questions? Were you able to get the land that was purchased out of the insurance policy? Um, I forgot about that, so no, I have not followed up on that. Uh, do we have a motion to accept the director's report? So we moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 New business, reviewing the strategic plan followed by discussion of the land lease policy. Okay, I'm just going to go through this quickly um, because, again, as we go through looking at how to gauge different air service and what our wants, needs, desires are. Um, two years ago when we did that process, um, we put together kind of a form to kind of help the authority kind of rate or rank um, different proposals. I just kind of wanted to, since there's been turnover on the board, and I'm not sure everyone is very familiar with this strategic plan or was necessarily involved in it. I just kind of wanted to quickly gloss over it. Um, if anyone wants a copy, if you don't have one, let me know and I will get it to you. Um, but anything that you think is important for me to be following up on as I talk to prospective carriers, I would basically like that input from the board. It makes sense that that should potentially stem from our um, written document. So I'm going to, again, quickly go through this. Um, oh, this is I. So a lot of boilerplate, I'm going to skip all that and kind of get to the goals. So these were the four goals that this board, now approximately four years ago, um, determined were the overall goals for the airport. Number one being economic development, and I think this is where a lot of the air carrier um, items come out of the, that um, topic. Goal number two, communication collaboration with variety of different entities, whether it be local or you know, more regional or statewide. Um, airport infrastructure, making sure that the facility we have um, is in keeping with um, standards and our needs. And then you know, organizational development. So just kind of going through the strategies that came out of, especially the economic development, I'll focus on this mostly, I'll glance over the other goals. Um, number of flights, um, again, directly ties into um, air carrier. Um, Enplanements, that magic number of 10,000. Since this time, um, Congress has created the $8,000 number, so there is a lower threshold um, for us to achieve, but realistically, 
two years ago was our high point, which was just over 5,000, and we've been on a downward trend the last two years. Um, customer service and reputation, again, this is something that really ties into the airline and poor service, translates into direct um, tar or marring of our reputation um, for what it is we offer. Grants and obviously keeping things funded. Uh, that. And then feasibility, since again, this is on economic development, so we were looking at trying to brainstorm and come up with ideas as to how we could attract various businesses here. And these are some of the things that came out of our discussions um, at the time this document was written. Restaurants on um, airport, aircraft maintenance business, or, or anything aviation related that is a business. And I think the, the Ryan Shively thing, while it's not maintenance, you know, some of the things he's planning with his aircraft and possibly other things, um, I think fits into that care category. We talked a little bit about air cargo and how we kind of missed the boat when you know, the FedExes and the UPSs of the world decided where they were going to set up their operations. Um, Long-term hangar facility um, that basically could provide an airport-owned facility that could be used for some of the above. And I think this uh, arrangement with Ted Aaron's hangar actually is a step in this direction because that is really the biggest hangar we have on property and now we hopefully can come under our control and potentially um, come up with something that will ultimately increase economic development and revenue for the airport. Car rental, it's been an issue forever and it remains an issue. Um, taxi and shuttle services and how they view the airport and provide service to our um, our passengers, whether it be airline or general aviation. Um, communication collaboration, I'm just going to skip really over this. Um, there are some things in here, marketing, um, we do have an annual marketing plan, which the board reviews. We did that last month. Um, we, at this time, talked about a reward or loyalty program that ended up morphing on the marketing side into something really different than what was envisioned at this point. Um, we've periodically hosted business after hours out here with the chamber. Um, we kind of are a little bit too small for the size of those events as they've been growing. Um, but, you know, potentially if we did a June in the new hangar. A, a June would be potentially better <laughs> than what the, the months closed. we've had. Because I think we've done April and May and the weather hasn't necessarily cooperated a lot. You could get to those. June is a... a I think June is their golf outing and I think they don't do July. No. So, you know, right there. They're, they're not really time for our you know, conditions here and having something that you can guarantee good, good weather outside. Um, my screen frozen. Uh, intermodal ground transportation. Um, we had talked and again, car rental again comes up here um, in multiple bullet points, just car rental in general, being able to have something that has online booking to, that can tie into the online purchasing process of an airline ticket. Um, Dial-A-Ride, there had, had been a couple discussions with Dial-A-Ride that really haven't gone anywhere. Um, Taxi services, we don't really have reliable taxi services in this area. Um, it's very hit and miss. Um, 
you know, we have their business cards, but half the time people will call and say no one answered. Um, Barry, have you met the uh, new economic development professional at the chamber yet? Yes, uh, I've, I've met with Mark. And well, I, I don't think you have time to be moving to all these things, do you? Really? Maybe we could pick out the I'm, key ones and I, I, ask him if he'll follow through. On I've that. already mentioned some of these Go things ahead. to him. He and I are scheduled to get together um, to have a, a more in-depth conversation Great. at some point. That's good to hear. Yeah. Airport infrastructure, um, all of these things have been discussed at some level or another in our capital projects committee, whether it be um, hangers and um, improving them overall, the capital improvement plan for the airport, um, purchasing land, that actually has been accomplished, um, existing hangers. And then on the organizational side, regional airport authority, we at one point did approach uh, Mason County when they were going through kind of their restructuring of how they were going to manage the airport and basically threw that out there as an option. Um, they did not seem to um, gravitate towards that. Um, I routinely meet with the Frankfurt Airport um, manager slash they, they've got an interesting operating relationship there. Um, just trying to keep dialogue open as their that airport struggles for a variety of reasons and then you know board governments yeah, and well I'll, I'll talk about this last one compensation board membership with Doug's leaving the board I think this is an area that the board, you know, could spend a little bit of time with thinking about how they would like to see a replacement and if recruiting for that could be, you know, done to build out the board in ways that make sense for the needs of what we have in front of us. So, quick overview. Um, if you don't have this document, let me know and I will get it to you. But I really wanted to go through that and then ask the question, what are your priorities as it relates to air service um, for the next bid cycle? Because what, I'm, what I've learned over doing this now five or six times every two years is a lot of the work happens before that bid is submitted. Once the bid is on paper, the, the decision process has been made by that carriers to how they're approaching us because they've locked it into numbers. If there are things that we want them to consider, variations on service, et cetera, that's all got to be done before they you know, put that pencil to paper and you know, crunch the numbers for what it is they're offering. So Again, I, I mentioned to you earlier some of my thoughts around seasonality, some of the things I'm trying to accomplish, but I really want to hear from your direction as well, just so that I'm following through on your wishes as it relates to um, the future of air service in this particular question. I think scheduling is extremely important, trying to get people in and out in the morning. Um, <clears throat> If you look back historically, when we had our 10-month run with Frontier, we were going to Milwaukee. That's when we had our best ridership. And since then, we have gone to Chicago, trying to develop the Chicago market. Do I think that's wrong? No. But I think connectivity trumps Chicago market, because if we have that connectivity, we broaden it to everyone, as opposed to just say, Chicago's our market. Uh, I don't know. I'd love to. I'd love to have a small jet service that you know gets out of here by nine in the morning. But you know, uh, whether or not, you know, that's probably nothing but a pipe dream trying to accomplish that. Well, we approached them before, didn't we? or they approached us before, didn't, didn't we? 
few years ago? Well, we had a couple of them that were hinting around but never really put the paper, pen to paper and, and made a proposal. And like with Sky West, when I was on the phone with them, you know, I asked them point blank, last time you, the reason you gave for not bidding was limited gate availability in Chicago. And his response was, gates in Chicago are tight at times. So it's entirely possible if they bid, they might bid with not having an early morning departure because that's when gates are tightest <clears throat> in that airport is everyone's trying to get out or get in to then connect to get out early in the morning. So those are, you know, reasonable thoughts to consider. You know, I, I'm still an advocate for if we could have a connectivity between here in Grand Rapids to wherever, a stop in Grand Rapids, no different than Traverse City to Manistee to Chicago, Manistee, Grand Rapids, Chicago. Uh, you know, we don't want to lose sight you're here to serve the residents of the community. If you're trying to bring in customers for business, there's no question, but that connectivity is got, I think, Tell me where it's at, but. I've used the Wisconsin one. That, I mean, personally, I loved flying into Wisconsin and connecting from there when we used to do that. Mm -hmm. It was so easy. I hate going through Chicago. I flew that several times as well, so that was interesting to hear your comment about potentially hearing from a company right. that's. I mean, we kind of heard that last time. Right. So if it's further down, the ball's been pushed down the court a little further on that. What I read was they're looking at starting initially with potentially three routes, um, Grand Rapids, um, I think Omaha, and maybe St. Louis is the third. Um, Milwaukee to those three locations? Yes, yes. Basically, airports, they don't have nonstop flights now that their business community has, for In whatever case. reason, a, a relationship with where mm -hmm. you know, filling 50 seats you know, should be feasible. So it doesn't necessarily help us as the connecting airline to the country. Um, you know, what the, the largest airline in Milwaukee right now is Southwest. So in some ways it's not... Same as Midway. Same as Midway. But yes. more reliable. Probably. Maybe, maybe not. But the, the challenge with Southwest is they don't partner with anybody. So we would be kind of in the, the status quo, just a different Southwest hub. So Barry, you would say that still Chicago's our best next connection? It's, I mean, the, the thing I'll, I'll point out about with Jeff is there are a variety of factors, and they all interplay. So you can't say, you can't take one factor in isolation and say, well, if that didn't occur, it would completely negate because it may be strong in three other factors and weak in that one, and that still may ultimately be the best option. Um, so I would say, based on what I know of plans and operations in Milwaukee, I would say, yes, I think Chicago is better. Um, but, and, and then you think Chicago, you've got two airports, you know, O'Hare and Midway. <coughs> if you really want connectivity, you need to be in O'Hare. And O'Hare can be a nightmare as an airport. It's also, you can get anywhere in the world in one stop from there. So, pro and con. Um, but if you want connectivity, um, Midway and Milwaukee probably are not it. And then it really is Detroit or O'Hare, maybe Minneapolis, but that you're flying an awful lot west if you so don't want to go east. You need to, does a cycle happen? You need to submit documents to the FAA saying this is what we desire? No. Do they bid it? Or are they, without saying anything, would a SkyWest or one of these other come to us and possibly say, we're going to bid Manistee to Grand Rapids? I mean, they could do that if they wanted. They could do that if they wanted. But somewhere it along is, the line, don't we have it, to tell them our desires? Exactly. And that's, that's really why I'm asking these questions for you to think about, is when I'm having these conversations, I'm trying to seed ideas. Because 
they don't know us, they don't know right. our market. They're just going to look at historically what's happened and, you know, you know, they're not going to spend days of researching the Manistee market to come up with and, you know, a creative proposal. So do we have to build a narrative that kind of explains some of the difficulties so they don't just look at the numbers and go, why do I even want to bid? Um, that, that's easier for me because I can explain those, but the what would we like them to provide um, and why, that's where I want to make sure that I'm on the same page as the board. Two flights a day in the summer, one flight a day in the winter, we prefer to go to Chicago, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then they bid that, potentially. Or they step out and say, that's not where we fly, so we're not going to bid that. Right. How does ground remembrance fit in on this? <clears throat> Do they have enough connectivity um, or what? Uh, to me, they've got, they've got all majors. Yeah. yeah, so it would be the connectivity. You know, it's like you said, two in the summer, one in the winter, connectivity, timeliness, you know, efficiency. Interesting about EAS is the minimum is two. So there is no one in the winter. It's two in the winter, two in the summer. And we negotiated that with Jim to get more in the summer and less. Yeah, but that's yes. exactly. So, right. so it could be three in the summer. Correct. <laughs> if we stay with. Right. At this point, we're talking standard essential air service yeah. because that's what these bids will be. Mm -hmm. And then we can. Jim is pick and choose, and we can. I mean. There's no reason we couldn't go back to any of these carriers and say, would you consider operating under alternate, changing the business model, because here's why we think that that could be beneficial to us and you. Is there enough profitability to do the seasonal here? Is it like if you get Sky West to do the summer, because that makes sense for them and it makes sense for the seasonality, is there enough business for one of these other Groups to still bid for the winter. The, the subsidy is there. The subsidy okay, is your profitability. Yeah, they 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 all go into this knowing they're going to lose, and then they turn that loss into the government. And they're allowed to mark that up a little bit, so they come out at a proper margin if the government accepts the. At the end if of I remember the day, right, you you said there in a rare case the FAA might say, "Sorry, I know you want to choose that company." but we're going to make you choose this other company because it's going to cost us less money. Correct. But that's rare. Yeah. So the process is, again, DOT puts out an RFP for bids for air carrier service. We then get an opportunity to basically review them and submit our desires. DOT takes that into account in their decision-making process. I would say generally 90, 95% of the time, the will of the community is ultimately the choice, but there are circumstances where the community wants this and DOT says, no, you're going to get something else, which and the almost, community then has the option of saying, we don't want either and we'll do alternate instead, which is kind of where we've been the last few cycles. I think, I mean, discussion for this room, every proposal that was presented last year to us was over a million dollar loss, or a few years ago, wasn't it? Well over a million dollars mm -hmm. in loss. Mm -hmm. So then they, that's what they turn in for their subsidy. Now that money is there for this purpose, so it's not like we're, um, that's what you hear in the community sometimes, is that, uh, well, our tax money is going to, kind of is, but it's already sitting there waiting to be issued to these airports across the country for this purpose. So it's, um, so every airline bids knowing it's a loss and they're going to turn that loss in to get subsidy. Uh, my, I won't be here for this cycle, but it just seems like the last two years has been a lot of focus on we're chasing our tail with issues with the airline when this should be <clears throat> just smooth. So I hope whatever choice is made, it's a smoother three years than the last two have been. Yeah, whatever stock that was there, it's gone up in smoke. I think it's probably fair, pretty fair to say. Any other thoughts? Jeff gave me a list of things. I mean, any other priorities that others on the board feel? Where does price come into play? 
I think price is important, but I think scheduling is probably more important. You know, well, the flying public, obviously, if, if somebody gets a ticket that they can fly out to, for lack of better terms, Denver for 150 bucks, yeah, that gets people moving. But if you're talking the difference between 320 and 360, if I don't have to drive two hours to get there and pay for my parking when I get there, I don't. And that's that's where I'm at. I mean, I, I drive every three weeks back and forth to Grand Rapids just because it's. That's convenient. that's the person we need to capture. But it just doesn't work for me as far as there's scheduling no what. If yeah, there's no. Interline agreements, there's no, if I could have the ease, I'd pay more if it was easy. But if I've got to go grab my bag and go back through security and do all that, that's just, that's never going to work for me. I'm just well, it's the same thing for me. If I go to Houston, I'm going to Houston. If I, if I fly out of here, I'm looking at probably a three-day trip as opposed to an overnight. Mm -hmm. and that's why, I, like I said, I, I take the last flight back. Yeah, I, got, I had to drive two hours at 1.30 in the morning last night to get back here, but it still gives me more time. For what I'm going there for. Of course, uh, I'd, I'd have to tack on an extra day to fly in and out of here. Have you ever gone in and out of Muskegon? No. It's just where if I'm going to drive down. You might as well go the extra. I'll just go yeah. down. Has anybody and recently? And then get to non stop. Not recently, but yep. I've used them several times. Yeah, it's been a long time, but my experience was good. I've mm -hmm. used them a few times. It's interesting living in Grand Haven, you, how infrequently I hear of people using Muskegon's airport. I mean, it's 12 minutes from, you can be there, I mean, in less than 12 minutes to the airport, but people go to Grand Rapids. And it's got, it just must be the options it's versus not, United. To me, it's not, it's just, it's quicker. So I can, yeah. I drive down and catch a 6 a.m. flight. I'm in Denver by 7.30. I take the last flight back at 8.30, and I'm back here by 1.30 in the morning. And I, I'll pay more to avoid going through Chicago. And that's where, if SkyWest, which is branded United, it'll be a Chicago deal. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if we could connect in Grand Rapids. Oh yeah, I think you get a lot more people. I mean, you know, cause people, if you can make that that connection and get to wherever you want to go, I mean, I would jump on that really quick because you're in Grand Rapids, you're paying for a room sometimes, which some places you can do a room in parking, but it's just a hassle. It's always a hassle. Does, Traverse, still have to does home. Traverse City do any flights in the Grand Rapids, huh? They avoid it. Or even Detroit, maybe. Yeah, Detroit's good enough. Well, if you're international, you get to Detroit. Yeah, right. And you got, the, the thing of it is, and I can't wrap my head around, I've asked this question in the past, you've got the old McNamara terminal, and then you got the new one. And why they have no connectivity between the two. And if they do, nobody seems to know if there is one. Uh, because they, there's a whole lot of stuff out in the old McNamara terminal that has been renovated. I don't know if anybody's ever been there. But there's a lot of different airlines that are out there also. It's not just Delta. Because Delta is primarily, well, you know, primarily not Delta. Pardon? It's basically everybody but Delta. Was it on a Delta? I think it was. Well, then you would have been in the new term, right. you know, 20 plus years. So, is that something the airport's ever looked at? Was Detroit? Um, then you're competing with Traverse mm -hmm. City. The same well, as you are when going to Chicago. Chicago, I mean. Yeah. I would say we've never discounted it. Um, the, if you look at that list, none of them partner necessarily with Delta. And if you're going through Detroit and you're not partnering with Delta, that doesn't make sense. So that's often then yeah. you know, the issue. Or in a scenario where you don't have any partner, like we you know, find ourselves in, the feeling has been there's more synergy in getting people to come fly up to our area from Chicago versus flying up from um, Detroit. The only real numbers I have on that is out of Traverse City, Chicago is their 
fourth top OMD market, and Detroit is 17th. Generally, Detroit's a in-state, it's a drive destination, where Chicago is considered more flying, even though distance-wise they're pretty close. How does Grand Rapids fit in? How would or would they not fit in? They got good connections, don't they? I mean, they're growing every year. And you take a huge bite out of the market. I mean, there's a lot of people that will travel down to Grand Rapids state mm -hmm. and park their vehicles and drop, you know, take a flight. Mm -hmm. So if we could have that connectivity, you know, access to all those, I, I, people wouldn't drive down there. They'd jump on a plane here, go to Grand Rapids. That would be ideal. You're uh, right because you just described my scenario. So what do we have to I do? Just, what do you do? Mm -hmm. well, what do we have to do to do that? I guess we just have to. It's, it's on. It's on my list. Thanks to, to say, thanks to Jeff bringing it up. Mm -hmm. yeah. As I talk to carriers, I'm going to throw that out there. Yeah. I, I, and really someone like SkyWest, it won't uh, make sense for them because right. they're in O'Hare. Right. But some of these smaller carriers, you know, that may not have operations in the area. They'd be willing to do whatever. So. Or you might have a combination where you go from here to Grand Rapids. Uh, if we do in the summertime, you do two flights a day out carrying the people, and you go one just directly to Grand Rapids and then come back, or however you want to do it, then you can have a continuation <coughs> of one of the flights going on to Chicago. Combination that of Significantly yeah. increased costs, and I have ground right. crew in two different right. airports, okay. et cetera. But, but, but you know, that's an option to look at. It may come back to stopping in Grand Rapids. Okay, well, thank you for that input and those thoughts. Discussion of land use policy of 1999. So I actually mentioned that earlier. And then I'm realizing that I didn't print it. Um, you updated this current one, Barry? Yes. So I re basically recreated. So Doug has a copy of what was in the minutes of the 1999 meeting. Um, I've updated that. At this meeting, I don't think it makes sense that you know, you haven't had a chance to read it. I just think that that it, that policy does need to be adjusted. If anything, I think it's item number two on there says that all land leases shall expire 14 years from now, which, given what we're trying to do with Brian Shively, doesn't work. So there, there are things in there that just don't work in the current environment. And if you'd what? like me to come back with some suggested changes, if you'd like a committee to, yeah, you, to you, do that. You sent your suggested changes to the capital committee, and then when we meet before the next December, we can make sure it all flows in what Ryan's trying to do. Okay. I, oh, oh, <coughs> there we are. You're talking about this? To no, this is a document you do not have. Okay, but um, you're just I, pulling this out to perhaps look at it, review it, and update it. Correct. Correct, because it ties into other decisions that okay, are so being made. All of what's in there was, has been attached to the lease with Ted Aarons, right? Correct. I presume. You know, Correct. Because yes. that's pretty intensive in there. Yes. It covers a lot of territory. Yep. Okay. This this is much simpler. Okay. This is just 15 bullet points, basically. Oh, okay. So. Uh, they just need a, a little bit of tweaking. But this is like the, the mass. Ted's was Wait. deep. Yeah, I, yeah, it is. Who made that up? I, I don't know. Somebody, well, it says on the back. Uh, they got paid for the word. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's see. What well, that was, it was Dan Heslin. So that, that would be my suggestion is if yeah. you want to send maybe yep. the old and the new mm -hmm. with some strikes to uh, the three of us on the committee, and then we can meet and uh, bring back to December a <coughs> version. Why do they have a 14-year requirement there? In there? What's, what's the real purpose for that? 
It is the date that Ted Aaron's lease expires and the Orchard Beach lease expires. Why they said all future should expire on that same date, I don't know. Going back to Karen's question to me, I mean, ideally, if we were rocking and rolling, you'd have five or six or seven different buildings in this scenario, and it's all great economic situations for the airport, and why they all expire on one day just doesn't, I, it, the, yeah, I can't grasp why. Saving legal costs. Get <clears> them <throat> all done in one day. So, I, don't know. I also did hand out the draft of the, basically the follow-up from our special meeting. I thought actually that's what that was on new business, but then realized it's not because I had asked you to put that on there. Um, so we do need to talk about this um, as to is this acceptable as an agreement and yeah, I had, uh, so who was not, Jeffrey, the only one not here, are you familiar with what the discussion was and what the as offer has been? Just as a brief thing, running through what the minutes, it sounds plausible to me. Okay, so ultimately the uh, Ted came to us and said he'll walk away 14 years early. So, so you know what that means, we're giving up his yeah. lease for 14 years, that's revenue. Uh, he's asking for use of a T hanger at no charge for 14 years, but has agreed that if we, if that T hanger building becomes full or the other nine units are rented and we have a client that is interested in renting the 10th unit, he at that point in time will start to pay us rent or will vacate so that the airport doesn't lose income. We get his building next spring in April at the end of his agreement with Jim Gallagher and then uh, it falls on us to fix the door and then we have that building to rent in the future and recoup revenue or begin making potentially more revenue than we've made on the ground lease. Is that a, if is if a, you take the, the uh, North Country out of the equation, we'd still do it with uh, I would say it sounds yes, or be yes and no. I because, and the reason I pose that question is, is not knowing into the future who our aircraft is going to have, or what it's going to be, that may or may not fit for that specific purpose. Correct. You're getting a relatively sound new building with an improved door, or repaired door, uh, and a product goes into our rental fleet that we don't have right now. Typically, somebody that's going to rent that is going to be renting it more for a lot more than $150 a month. Right. And we'll go it would generally be, I mean, I would ballpark that $1,000 a month would be a, a hanger like that. But, well, you got to find the customer. you got to find the customer. Right. So, so the thought and the discussion at that meeting is if in the next few months the capital committee who's ever sitting on that, the authority makes a decision, to ask the county for funding to, to complete the T-hangers in one fell swoop. We rolled an estimated door cost into that and they're all done at one time as one mm -hmm. financial package. So, so we left that meeting going to George and saying, can you draft a relatively simple but appropriate document and that's what's in front of us today. And when I read through it, the only thing that I caught was that George had put in here uh, he's not going to pay any rent even while he's still collecting rent from North Country. Yeah, and I don't think that's... Th 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 this is saying that we take possession in the spring, but it then also says that we relieve him of any financial obligation to pay us until the spring. But if, if that got tweaked, I don't think Ted would disagree with that either. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also um, found a couple areas where I just wanted to talk about... Um, I know that we talked about, you know, there's nine, um, nine units available. What if somebody comes and, or he's in number nine. So what if somebody comes and says, that's the ideal one for me? I, I kind of thought we talked about that. And it's like, if somebody, a purchaser comes along and says, I want to purchase and rent that, that he said he would leave. So it's different than right. 
vacating if everything else is used. Um, it might be another situation where it's like I don't know I don't know these hangers, but like maybe nine is like the perfect one for whatever I need. What happens then? Once and if we finish repairing the hangers, I cannot foresee a reason that a particular unit would be more desirable than another with the exception of the end units. The end units tend to have more space. And this is, let's see, five, six, seven, eight. Not, that is, but that's not the big end unit. It's the small end unit. He's on this side? He's on this side, yes. That's, that's a valid point. I don't know that we need a, unless, uh, unless George could amend that to say, work with the authority on which unit, that it's not a specific number. It doesn't matter to me what he's in, they're all identical to me, except, you know, like you said, there are two that have a little bit of extra room. And I, I have a feeling that he's not going to run out the 14 years. No, Based on, no he's downsizing yeah. and selling stuff right. off, so the lake, in all likelihood, he'll step away. <clears throat> right. Does it mention that? If he does, there's no monetary... Well, there's a conversation about uh, decide to continue on from the sea after being notified, releasing all available hangers. I, there, there should be a time frame for an exit. Um, so if he does, he wants to be out of there and says, I'm going to leave, then we should have a time frame. You have 30 days. Well, or it says that uh, by him choosing to leave this agreement early, there's no, no we're not giving him any, burden. Yeah, we're not paying him any cash back. But uh, if, he's, if he says, I'm going to leave early, what does that mean to him? I'd like a time on that. It's like, well, I'm going to leave early. I'm going to leave 13 years instead of 14. I, you know, it's like, give us some idea of what you're talking about. And if you say you're going to leave, then here, 60 days, you're out, or 90 days, you're out. Um, just don't want it being a hanger on her. Well, this is, saying, this is saying that we're giving him, we agree, at zero rate for up to 14 years. Correct. I don't know that he would be able to tell us and put mm -hmm. a signature on paper when he plans to be out if it's earlier than that 14 years. Well, what I, but what I'm hearing Karen say is that, let's say three years from now, he says, I'm going to be leaving. And basically notifying us that he's going to be leaving. Right. Does that trigger, oh, now you've got 90 days to actually get right. out, as opposed to, I'm going to be leaving and then it's three years later and He's still not out. If we can start marketing and we can start looking, I mean, okay. it goes into our master plan. Um, and yeah, 90 days, you know, it's like closing out a house. Yeah. Right. Right. So just something in there where he says, I'm going to leave, he's got 90 days to go ahead mm -hmm. and execute what he's talking about. And then, uh, in your unit number. Anything else? And he pays the electrical and all that stuff I see in there. There, there is none in that building. George oh, okay. would. He, I don't think. The other T hanger, there is electrical for each unit. So when I was in that, I paid a lease and I paid the. I got a separate billing for the electric. Uh, that T hanger doesn't have that. Unless we want to go through the expense of metering them all, and I think that's not, yeah. enough, <laughs> not enough to. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, this, George is on notice that this has to get done right away, so he'll probably tweak this immediately. Um, so, I guess. Is there do anything we need... in the current policy that prohibits us? From moving forward, like, do we need to have the policy update before this? I know you have that and update for the other one. No. Authority. Authority. No, that's here on the ground. That's going to be more Ryan because this is relinquishing his. Yeah, yeah. Us. I'm not sure oh, there's okay. nothing we else. No, there's there's like, yeah, how does it? Board of commissioners. Not signed by the authority. Yeah, when I was um, doing the minutes the other day, I looked at the actual lease agreement in the beginning, and that is between the county of Manistee. And Mr. Aaron's. What year? This is in '99. I did send a copy. Um, and then this is actually signed by Sherry Wild. I wonder why. So I'm just wondering 
It kind of just has to go back to the county to get out of this <clears throat> and give it to the authority. Just, just oh, a, yeah, it could be a formality, but I'm wondering why the heck the county would have to bless. I would think that would be within the boundaries of the authority. Yeah. It's well, signed by Sherry Wild and Marilyn the clerk. When did the county essentially give the land to the authority? That, that, is, a, that is around that era. It's around, the, it's yes, around that like, era, because I was on 94 through 02. And, and there was, was somewhere city, in there. the city still involved? In yes, it? they were. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. That, that was. There That's was where Barry's seat comes from. Is yeah. the, he's, right. the, he's the right. lone city appointment. Right. So would this that would be a question back to George? Yeah, the I think. Of it? I think. That would be a fair question. Yeah. Should, yeah. The, should the county also be a signer? Well, or the county can defer it, you know, to the authority. Right. You know, we don't have to be involved at all. Just make that a formal somehow. Well, right. it's one of those deals if you don't do it right, then you get yeah. an FAA. You know, yep. No yep. different, you're yep. dressing that up. Yep. It's almost like is there need to be some type of a, something drafted that, that gives yeah. the authority now in all past documents. Right. Mm -hmm. there, and there probably is when, that, when the property and assets were transferred. From the county and the city, so Ted, Ted's that's, lease that's a, a was, George question was signed in '99 mm -hmm. yeah. with Sherry Wild. Yeah. Oh, was the, the county person, Tom Kaminsky. Mm -hmm. It it's just it says and the like agreement is between the county and Ted, mm -hmm. so it does not mention the airport authority. Okay. Yeah. So he's he. Negotiating with the county, <coughs> and the county can divert it to the authority. Why don't we try to, uh, you and I try to have a, see if George will jump on a phone call again with us in the morning. He was pretty but is this something that you guys would want to take to the board meeting, which is tomorrow? Yeah, you're going to invite him tomorrow morning. So. Yeah. I just thought it'd be as easy just to say, you know. That we move everything to the authority, but probably talking to George yeah, would be yeah. better. I don't think this should stop Jim and mm -hmm. Ted's plans. Yeah. Because uh, I think overwhelmingly it's supporting. Mm -hmm. So, I, but we can't take any action on this today, then. Okay, I think that's right. All right. But we drawing. probably will need to take action before a month from now. Yeah. So. Um, so that's another special meeting. Mm -hmm. You local residents. Well, you know, well, there again, how many can call in? How many got to be present to act on that? I mean, you got, you got, if I can, drive you know what? Way. If I can set up, maybe that'll be, if I met with uh, uh, Ryan, I could, we can have a committee meeting the same day and probably should announce that publicly, right? Am I in default every time we have a committee meeting that I don't? Well, I'm just, no, I'm just saying that that might be the solution for that. It's just right. You call in and be done all for. on the agenda. I thought we were going to remove off the agenda that billboard. that billboard so I could leave with a clear conscience, knowing it's not handled, but... Remove it or not remove it? I thought we... Yeah, I, I, is I there a new owner, owner of that, or is it still... Well, that's, that's well the one of them passed away, so we don't know what the status is at the moment. At the moment, it's still under new ownership. Every time we want to get more contract. focused on it, it's something, something else comes up. up. All right, um, so no comment on billboards, right, Mary? The comments by authority members. Jeff? Jeff? Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> None for me, except for one. <clears throat> Remember what Jeff said. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving and Merry Christmas. Yeah, thank you. I'm ahead of the game there. <laughs> All right, I have one more meeting. And as Barry mentioned, and we've had some conversations, and I know Jeff has some ideas, but I'm going to turn in a letter of resignation for next meeting, and then they want to announce the position in the paper. So I, I thought I heard Barry say he was still interested. 
because he feels like he's finally up to speed, but he's not here to. Was he, was he sick? Because he wasn't at the last meeting. Either. I don't know. Oh. He was at the special meeting. Yes, yeah. he was at the special meeting. So, um, so I think his had, intention think is to resubmit his had. name. Yeah. Um, Who comes up this year? Mark. Yeah. But he's appointed by the commissioners. Right. And then Barry Peterson. Okay. And then Doug's. And then I did talk to Jill. But you haven't sent anything yet. yet. Okay. Because then she'll advertise for those. I think she said like the end of this month. Mm -hmm. Or by the end of the month, she'll put the advertisement out. Mm -hmm. So as I leave, um, you have no real voice for the public flyers that use the airport. And that's one of the reasons that Barry asked me to stick my name in the hat years ago is that there was no representation in this room from anybody that flew on a regular basis and was a renter and a user of the airport from a general aviation perspective. Do you have a recommendation? Um, there are a few other tenants and whether the authority thinks that that's the direction to replace my seat or Jeff had the thought that you know, the strategic plan calls for a lot of economic development. Mm -hmm. So, th did you talk to Stacy? She'd like to get on. Stacy, the chamber director, is is interested in coming on board. If you know, everything is a different voice. So it's, it's, it's about timing, and so what you're what you're trying to accomplish at that given moment. I think it's valuable to have some of the flies. For the <coughs> stuff too. I guess the closest very, <coughs> I guess, but you know, it'd be good. To have someone on the board that does fly. I mean, who, who here right now flies on a regular basis has their own plane? No, I couldn't even answer that question, yes. Yeah, you couldn't? You sold your plane? No, I still have it. I just don't use it. Yeah. I think that's important to have somebody. I, I, think, I think it's important, but as you said, the timing, there's people coming and going all the time on the authority, so is what's the best at this point in time? If there's a candidate that's a, a tenant of the airport that's a pilot that we that Barry through discussion thinks would be interested, then but if it's if nobody's interested right now and they're not going to be valuable, uh, and Stacy's a better fit, or somebody in the economic development marketing mm -hmm. area is a better fit, as you are facing challenges with selecting uh, an airline in the next year. Mm -hmm. um, well, then as a second, I think would be like the, the new economic development person because a lot of the stuff that we've seen here is stuff that is economic development. And Barry doesn't have the time to do it. We don't really have the time to do it. So that seems to make some sense to me. Well, we've got one. We've got, say, two of the three because the one comes from the city. And you never know who will see the ad and paper and just put their name up there. Then it goes, then it's your, yeah. and then it falls to the county. No, well, we didn't used to have three commissioners on the board at one time either. That was a issue that came up five years ago, no, six years since, ago. Has it always been three? Since the bylaws were rewritten after the city, <clears throat> after the city left, okay. it's been three. Because I know they were looking at bylaw changing and what have you. I thought that was a topic back when Alan was on the board. Yes. Oh, so it on the two? No, it was because of, I forget what, I forget the minutia of what was at play at that time. I was stretching you guys too. No, 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 it was. Part, part of it was with the city um, position of taking that out of the bylaws. Obviously, the, since the county still appoints them, they could appoint however they wanted but not having it written in the bylaws was part of the changes discussed at that time. And there was also some wording about the county commissioners, and I think it might have been changing a shall to a may. So instead of saying it has to be three, that it can be three. It's three seems heavy. It's just a... It's not a bad situation to have, I mean, because it is a primary funder. It's an easier lift if you got three people on board than going in with two. If you've got something you want to try to help out on. Is our delinquent tenant from history staying current on his new billing? Good. Yeah. Good. Did you just really a receipt come back today? <laughs> I 
That's one thing that's got fixed. Yeah, I was going to say, you kicked some butt there. I don't want me, but... <coughs> well, we're going to miss you, too. I'm going to miss it. I've gone yet. I've gone yet. Yeah. Some, He'll retire someday. you got some things to take care of. Okay, that was just, that was my comments, is you never know who's going to throw their name in the hat, but if, if you have conversations, I know Barry's open, he's, he's had that conversation with me whenever I called, so. Okay. How about our dear friend, Ted Aaron? Uh, there's a... Want to sit on the board here? Yeah. I don't know, I, I don't know his background that well, but, you know, apparently he's in aviation through the years. Just a thought, just went through the mind. Yeah. No, he, he would be a good candidate. Has he ever been on the board? The, year, or the, or the authority? Not that I know of, but... He's heavily involved in... Um, veterans. Veterans. Yeah. Yeah, that's his... One yeah. of his, his pet, pet programs. Um, he's very fluent. Um, I think he's a very smart man, too. Um, I don't know that he's interested in being on any boards. That's the only thing. So it'd be, inter it'd be nice to maybe check and see if he's interested. Um, no, he's made some programs or, or I guess, uh, actions out here at the airport that have been valuable. So mm -hmm. we're done. Motion to adjourn. Second.